Welcome to the latest issue of Jack Case Reports, featuring 30 unique cases that provide educational insights into cardiology, while also promoting clinical problem solving and offering a platform for early career cardiologists and cardiovascular care teams. In the editor's page for this issue, Dr. Mirvat Alasnag discusses the importance of case reports in highlighting novel techniques, conditions, and diagnostic tools in clinical practice. Case reports contribute to innovation, education, scientific debut, and identifying research gaps in cardiology. As represented by this infographic, this viewpoint by Adam Ahmed explores the evolving role of social media in medical information sharing. It emphasizes the benefits of social platforms for accessing medical knowledge and engaging with experts. However, the article cautions that social media can oversimplify complex medical data and contribute to the spread of misinformation driven by platform algorithms. It advocates for best practice guidelines and the inclusion of social media literacy in medical education to promote ethical and accurate information sharing while preserving professional standards. This viewpoint by Cecilia Varga shares a deeply personal journey through the challenges of living with a heart condition. It underscores the importance of compassion, empathy, and effective communication in patient care. Drawing from personal experiences with misdiagnosis and invasive treatments, the article calls for a more humanistic approach in medicine, where listening to patients and validating their struggles are as crucial as the treatments themselves. This reflection reminds us that humanism should be at the core of medical practice. Case report on managing rapid atrial fibrillation using stellate ganglion blockade in a 73-year-old woman, highlighting the procedure and its clinical outcomes. This timeline details the key events of the case, from initial admission with atrial fibrillation to successful treatment and discharge. This ultrasound image demonstrates the needle path and target for stellate ganglion catheter insertion used in the case management. The graph shows the heart rate response following the initiation of stellate ganglion blockade with ropivacaine infusion. This case examines dyspnea following an acute intermediate risk pulmonary embolism with a multidisciplinary approach to treatment. The key objectives include identifying residual pulmonary vascular obstruction after pulmonary embolism, understanding the role of cardiopulmonary exercise testing, and highlighting the utility of balloon pulmonary angioplasty in patients with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary disease. These CT scans show a saddle embolism, obstructing both the right and left pulmonary arteries. Perfusion scans reveal multiple bilateral perfusion defects, indicating residual pulmonary vascular obstruction. Invasive cardiopulmonary exercise testing demonstrates improvements in mean pulmonary arterial pressure and cardiac output after balloon pulmonary angioplasty. This diagnostic algorithm outlines the evaluation of patients with persistent functional impairment after pulmonary embolism using ventilation perfusion scans, transthoracic echocardiography, and further referral pathways based on clinical findings. Pulmonary angiography images display the baseline right and left pulmonary arteries before any intervention. These angiograms show pre- and post-balloon pulmonary angioplasty images, with stenotic lesions and balloon inflations highlighted. Quality of life scores improved significantly after multiple BPA sessions, as shown in this chart. This clinical case explores an unusual occurrence of anthracycline-induced ventricular tachycardia during pregnancy, emphasizing management with beta blockers. Anthracycline-induced ventricular tachycardia can be managed with beta blockers, and should not contraindicate the continuation of therapy. The initial EKG shows sinus tachycardia on hospital admission. EKG recorded on day one shows non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. The telemetry strip confirms non-sustained ventricular tachycardia on day one of admission. This EKG strip shows non-sustained ventricular tachycardia after the second round of doxorubicin with metoprolol treatment. This clinical case presents the use of intravascular ultrasound-guided intravascular lithotripsy to treat a coral reef aorta at the level of the renal and visceral arteries. The case demonstrates the effectiveness of intravascular lithotripsy in treating calcified aortic lesions and the role of intravascular ultrasound in guiding the procedure. This CT image shows severe calcification of the aorta, occluding the left renal artery. The right renal artery remains patent with a bare metal stent, Aortography performed before treatment shows stenoses at the supraceliac and juxtarenal levels with a patent stent in the right renal artery. Intravascular ultrasound shows high-grade stenosis of the juxtarenal aorta with cross-sectional measurements consistent with CT findings. 
Postoperative imaging reveals good patency of both the aortic bare metal stent and the renal periscope bridging stent, with the center line of the Viabon stent shown by the dotted yellow line. This clinical case describes the use of temporary microaxial support in a patient with multiple postmyocardial infarction mechanical complications as a bridge to heart transplantation. Timely escalation to temporary microaxial left ventricular assist device support stabilized hemodynamics and relieved pressure in a patient with multiple postmyocardial infarction complications. Careful patient selection, including assessment of right ventricular dysfunction, is crucial for success. Chest radiographs show the focal left heart border bulge and the placement of the temporary microaxial left ventricular assist device in the left ventricle. This table details the hemodynamic and laboratory assessments over time, highlighting improvements in cardiac index, pulmonary artery pressures, and right ventricular performance following device support. Intraoperative images show a ventricular septal rupture and apical aneurysm with lateral pseudoaneurysm in the left ventricle, as indicated by the blue and yellow arrows. This clinical case outlines limb salvage in a patient with acute limb ischemia using continuous intraarterial infusion therapy for below the ankle arterial occlusions. This case highlights the recognition of acute limb ischemia due to plantar metatarsal artery occlusion, which is challenging to treat surgically or endovascularly. Additionally, it explores the effects of continuous intraarterial infusion therapy for limb salvage. Initial assessment images show pallor and coldness in the patient's foot, along with angiographic evidence of flow limitation in the distal anterior and posterior tibial arteries and occlusion of the lateral plantar artery. Angioplasty was performed using small diameter balloons on the plantar metatarsal arteries. A 22-gauge cannula was inserted into the dorsalis pedis artery to deliver continuous intraarterial infusion therapy. Follow-up angiography and images from day 8 and day 25 demonstrate improved blood flow in the affected arteries and significant improvement in skin color without progression of gangrene. This case report details the modification of the anterior mitral valve leaflet to prevent left ventricular outflow tract obstruction during transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Pre-procedural planning and leaflet modification are critical to the success of transcatheter mitral valve replacement in challenging cases. CT reconstruction images demonstrate the neo-left ventricular outflow tract measurement with the embedded Sapien 3 Ultra Valve. 3D models of the neo-left ventricular outflow tract show pre and post ablation views following alcohol septal ablation. Angiograms reveal the left anterior descending artery and the first septal perforator, both before and after alcohol septal ablation. CT images display measurements of the neo-left ventricular outflow tract with an embedded Sapien 3 ultra valve post ablation. Multiplanar reconstruction and fluoroscopy show the perforation and balloon dilation of the anterior mitral leaflet during the procedure. Post-procedural imaging illustrates the position of the Sapien 3 ultra valve and the gradient across the neo-left ventricular outflow tract. Step-by-step -step procedural images show perforation, valve positioning, and implantation using a 3D printed model. This comparison shows valve deployment through the left ventricular outflow tract before and after alcohol septal ablation and leaflet modification. This case report presents a cardioembolic stroke evaluation using cardiac CT in a patient with a mechanical aortic valve who is compliant with anticoagulation. The aim is to understand the role of cardiac CT as a non-invasive imaging modality for evaluating cardioembolic sources of stroke and its advantages over echocardiography in patients with mechanical valves. Non-contrast MRI of the head reveals acute infarcts in multiple vascular territories, suggesting a cardioembolic source of stroke. Cardiac CT demonstrates subvalvular panus formation on the mechanical aortic valve with Hounsfield units ranging from 179 to 220, correlating with impaired valve function. Cardiac CT multiplanar reconstruction reveals evidence of subvalvular panus with key measurements, including aortic valve peak velocity, mean pressure gradient, and acceleration time, supporting impaired valve hemodynamics. This case discusses coronary artery aneurysm thrombosis in a patient with Marfan syndrome, highlighting its role in acute coronary syndrome. Acute coronary syndrome in patients with connective tissue disorders may result from coronary artery aneurysm thrombosis. Management includes evaluating antiplatelet, anticoagulation therapies, and revascularization. Eleocaudal view shows an aneurysmal disease of the right coronary artery with incomplete filling as indicated by the red arrow. 
RAO caudal view demonstrates aneurysmal disease in the left coronary system, most prominent in the left anterior descending artery, marked by red and blue arrows. Coronary CTA of the right coronary artery shows a fusiform aneurysm of the right coronary artery with a filling defect, marked by red and blue arrows. Coronary CTA of the right coronary artery displays a 25 mm fusiform aneurysm in the right coronary artery, as indicated by the measurement Coronal view on CTA reveals a fusiform aneurysm of the right coronary artery, with a filling defect in the distal right coronary artery marked by red and blue arrows. Three-dimensional reconstruction of the right coronary artery shows diffuse aneurysmal disease, indicated by the star. This case presentation highlights the hemodynamic assessment of infants with congenital heart disease using ferramoxetol-enhanced 4D flow cardiac magnetic resonance. 4D flow CMR with ferramoxetol provides comprehensive hemodynamic data in infants with congenital heart disease, enabling detailed assessments of shunts and flow abnormalities for surgical guidance. This table outlines the key technical parameters used in 4D flow CMR for precise imaging of congenital heart disease, including slice thickness, temporal resolution, and velocity encoding. 4D flow CMR images reveal complex flow patterns in Epstein's anomaly, including tricuspid regurgitation and right atrial dilation, with shunting across septal defects. Quantitative analysis shows high regurgitant fraction and bidirectional flow across atrial septal defects, providing crucial insight into the hemodynamics of Epstein's anomaly. 4D flow imaging captures abnormal flow patterns in scimitar syndrome with pulmonary vein stenosis, showing significant flow disturbances in the left pulmonary veins. Flow parameters demonstrate reduced pulmonary vein flow and significant shunting, alongside angiographic evidence of pulmonary venous stenosis in scimitar syndrome. 4D flow CMR visualizes shunting across the ventricular septal defect and hypoplastic mitral valve, revealing impaired mitral inflow and systemic outflow. Quantitative analysis reveals the hemodynamic burden of VSD with borderline left ventricle, characterized by high flow volumes through the ductus arteriosus and the transverse aortic arch. This case explores a unique presentation of endocarditis associated with coronary cameral fistula, complicated by intracranial hemorrhage, emphasizing the importance of multimodality imaging. The case demonstrates that non-valvular endocarditis may arise due to coronary cameral fistulas and highlights the role of multidisciplinary teams in managing complex cases like these. Head CT shows right occipital intraparenchymal hemorrhage alongside an aneurysm in the distal right posterior cerebral artery distribution, as indicated by the black arrows. Coronary CT angiography reveals a complex coronary cameral fistula originating from two large obtuse marginal branches and a posterolateral left ventricular branch of the right coronary artery. 3D reconstruction of coronary CT shows detailed anatomy of the coronary cameral fistula, with large obtuse marginal branches and a posterolateral left ventricular branch of the right coronary artery supplying the fistula. Clinical vignette discusses a case of long-standing chronic recurrent pericarditis, highlighting the transition from anakinra to rilonacep therapy and its effect on symptom abatement. Serial transthoracic echocardiograms and CMR images demonstrate the progression and resolution of pericardial effusion over a five-year period, correlating with inflammatory markers. Improvement noted with anakinra and rilonacep therapy. This case describes an acquired coronary cameral fistula that mimicked prosthetic aortic valve regurgitation, emphasizing the challenges in diagnosing postoperative cardiac complications. The main objectives are to highlight the differential diagnosis of coronary cameral fistula following aortic valve replacement and the critical role of transesophageal echocardiography in evaluating complications after surgery. Preoperative transthoracic echocardiography revealed aortic valve stenosis with a mean pressure gradient of 39 millimeters of mercury and a calculated valve orifice area of one square centimeter. Transthoracic echocardiography demonstrated an obstruction in the left ventricular outflow tract with a dagger-shaped pattern on Doppler imaging, indicative of a thickened septal base. Postoperative transthoracic echocardiography showed abnormal diastolic blood flow that resembled aortic valve regurgitation, with Doppler imaging estimating a diastolic flow velocity of greater than 2 meters per second. Postoperative transesophageal echocardiography confirmed abnormal diastolic flow originating from the basal part of the interventricular septum near the aortic prosthesis, which indicated the presence of a coronary cameral fistula. 
Illustrative diagrams show the coronary cameral fistula in the current case, alongside comparisons with aortic valve regurgitation and paravalvular leak. The timeline of this case details the patient's journey from presenting with exertional shortness of breath to the discovery of a coronary cameral fistula following aortic valve replacement, with persistent findings on follow-up echocardiography. This case presents a rare diagnosis of endocarditis caused by Citrobacter cosari in a patient with close contact with chimpanzees. The objective is to consider endocarditis in patients with persistent tropical fever of unknown origin and understand the need for immunosuppressive factor evaluation in Citrobacter cosari infections. A timeline summarizing the patient's history from fever in the Congo, failure of empirical treatment, diagnosis of Citrobacter cosari endocarditis, aortic valve replacement, and eventual diagnosis of marginal zone lymphoma. PET-CT scan shows enhancement of the glands in the right axilla, indicating abnormal glandular activity in this region. Transesophageal echocardiography demonstrates extensive vegetations on the aortic valve, seen as thickened and irregular areas. The image of the resected aortic valve shows visible damage, with perforations and large vegetations, especially on the right coronary cusp as indicated by the arrowheads. This case discusses a patient with symptomatic pheochromocytoma and severe aortic valve stenosis. The case highlights the challenges of managing these combined conditions, focusing on diagnostic and treatment approaches, including a successful combination of pharmacotherapy and surgery. Patients with both pheochromocytoma and severe aortic valve stenosis present unique management challenges due to hemodynamic effects. A multidisciplinary team is essential to determine the best treatment strategy. The case emphasizes the importance of careful monitoring of therapies and outlines the steps for safe transcatheter aortic valve replacement followed by adrenalectomy. Transthoracic echocardiography images show a heavily calcified aortic valve with severe stenosis. The mean gradient measures as high as 70 millimeters of mercury, indicating significant obstruction. Multiple imaging techniques, including computed tomography, positron emission tomography, and magnetic resonance imaging, reveal a large adrenal mass with central necrosis. Additional tests show intense uptake, confirming the diagnosis of pheochromocytoma. The biochemical results indicate abnormally high levels of both plasma and urine metanephrines, confirming the biochemical diagnosis of pheochromocytoma, with levels significantly elevated compared to normal ranges. Pathology from the adrenalectomy demonstrates a well-circumscribed tumor with clear histologic features of pheochromocytoma. Immunohistochemistry confirms the diagnosis with chromogranin staining. Echocardiography following transcatheter aortic valve replacement shows normal functioning of the bioprosthetic valve with reduced gradients. The mitral valve also shows a significant decrease in obstruction. This proposed management algorithm emphasizes a stepwise approach, starting with pharmacological management of hypertension and tachycardia, followed by valve replacement and then adrenalectomy. Close monitoring and multidisciplinary care are critical throughout. This case explores physiological insights from asymptomatic severe valvular disease in a highly trained athlete, highlighting the challenges in assessing cardiovascular health in individuals with high levels of athletic training. The progression of mixed aortic valve disease is documented over a 10-year period using multimodality imaging, showing increasing gradients and left ventricular changes, despite the patient remaining asymptomatic. The timeline summarizing the progression of aortic valve disease alongside the patient's athletic achievements is shown, which includes participation in a half Ironman and an Ironman event, despite increasing left ventricular outflow gradients. The cardiopulmonary exercise test shows normal heart rate response and oxygen consumption, indicating excellent fitness, despite the severe valvular disease, highlighting the confounding impact of athletic remodeling. The comparison of pre- and post-exercise stress signal gradients across the subaortic membrane and aortic valve illustrates significant increases in gradients post-stress. This case involves a 34-year-old pregnant woman who experienced ventricular fibrillation and cardiac arrest, later diagnosed with endocarditis, which occurred without preceding symptoms. The learning objectives focus on recognizing uncommon causes of ventricular fibrillation in young patients without cardiovascular risk factors, understanding embolization leading to myocardial infarction in the context of endocarditis, and realizing the importance of a multidisciplinary approach and serial echocardiography. 
Blood test results reveal an elevated troponin I level at 1,115 and a high C-reactive protein level of 12.7. Transthoracic echocardiogram demonstrates a severely regurgitant aortic valve with significant echogenic thickening and left ventricular dilation. Coronary angiogram showed a dominant left coronary system without any significant disease. Transesophageal echocardiography confirms significant thickening and regurgitation of the aortic valve. MRI of the brain reveals high-intensity signals consistent with established infarcts in the cerebellum, suggesting embolization. Cardiac MRI shows borderline left ventricular size with normal function and small areas of late enhancement indicating infarcts in the midinfralateral wall. Histologic analysis of the aortic valve shows intimal thickening, myxoid degeneration, and calcific fibrosis without evidence of acute inflammation or vegetation. This case explores a rare scenario of near-continuous mitral regurgitation in a patient with severe chronic aortic regurgitation and first-degree atrioventricular block emphasizing the complexity of managing valvular diseases. The take-home messages highlight the importance of recognizing the rare combination of severe aortic regurgitation with atrioventricular block leading to near-continuous mitral regurgitation. It underscores the need for prompt surgical intervention and the potential benefits of optimizing atrioventricular synchrony. This electrocardiogram shows sinus rhythm with a first-degree atrioventricular block and poor R-wave progression, typical in this complex presentation. Pulsed wave Doppler imaging of the abdominal aorta reveals significant holodiastolic flow reversal, indicating severe aortic regurgitation. Continuous wave Doppler imaging demonstrates severe aortic regurgitation with a steep deceleration slope, a key feature in this patient's pathology. Color M-mode imaging from a transgastric view captures mitral regurgitation throughout most of the cardiac cycle, including both diastole and systole, the continuous wave Doppler recording of transmitral flow shows a distinct diastolic regurgitant signal followed by a systolic regurgitant signal, reflecting the near-continuous nature of mitral regurgitation. M-mode echocardiography reveals significant premature mitral valve closure, a phenomenon observed in this rare case of near-continuous mitral regurgitation. Pulsed wave Doppler of the pulmonary veins shows blunted systolic flow in all four pulmonary veins indicative of increased left atrial pressure from mitral regurgitation. CT angiography reveals aneurysmal dilation of the left coronary sinus of Valsalva, adding complexity to the surgical management considerations for this patient. Contrast-enhanced two-chamber view and volume-rendered image illustrate aneurysmal dilatation of the left coronary sinus compared to the right. A narrow neck inferior outpouching is visible, suggesting a pseudoaneurysm, indicated by the arrow, this case focuses on the management of guidewire-induced coronary perforation using a handmade embolization coil, emphasizing practical techniques when commercial microcoils are unavailable. Hemostasis of the perforation was achieved using a handmade coil created from available devices. Operators should be familiar with alternative methods to manage coronary perforation when commercial solutions are not readily accessible. Angiography shows a target lesion in the left circumflex artery, with subsequent guide wire perforation into a side branch, leading to extravasation of contrast material. A commercial curled microcoil was implanted at the bleeding point, but the coil slipped from the side branch, leading to failure in achieving hemostasis. Images show the process of preparing a handmade coil using a guide wire fragment, demonstrating how the wire is adjusted and inserted for embolization. The handmade coil is successfully placed at the bleeding point using a microcatheter, achieving hemostasis, and confirmed with final angiography. This case explores the complex interplay between myocardial infarction and pulmonary embolism, raising the question of whether the relationship is causal or merely temporal. The learning objectives of this case are to recognize myocardial infarction when it occurs with pulmonary embolism, explore potential pathophysiologic links, and suggest thrombolytic therapy for high-risk pulmonary embolism cases with ST-segment elevation myocardial infarction. EKG shows both ST-segment depression in leads V1, V2, and V3, and posterior lead recordings demonstrating ST-segment elevation in leads V7, V8, and V9. Chest CT angiography reveals bilateral pulmonary emboli and right ventricular dilatation compared to the left ventricular basal diameter. Pulmonary artery angiography images taken before and after thrombectomy using the Inari Flowtriever system, showing successful thrombus removal. 
Coronary angiography shows critical focal stenosis in the proximal right coronary artery, the left circumflex artery, and the mid-left anterior descending artery. This table outlines the patient's hospitalization, evolution of symptoms, diagnostic examinations, and laboratory findings over the 20-day period, including troponin and NT proBNP levels. This case series highlights four atypical presentations of spontaneous coronary artery dissection where patients present with angina or ischemia but without myocardial infarction, expanding the clinical spectrum of SCAD. The take-home messages emphasize the rare presentation of SCAD without myocardial injury and the importance of invasive coronary angiography with or without intracoronary imaging as the gold standard for confirming the diagnosis and guiding treatment. Coronary angiography reveals spontaneous dissection of the left anterior descending artery, with clear delineation of the dissection point shown by the arrows. Comprehensive CT angiography demonstrates arteriopathy with an S-shaped and coiled internal carotid artery and a splenic artery aneurysm, highlighting systemic vascular abnormalities associated with SCAD. Coronary angiography shows spontaneous dissection of the left main coronary artery with additional hematoma formation in the left anterior descending artery. Angiography during follow-up reveals worsening of the left main coronary artery dissection, marked by progressive luminal compromise. Fibromuscular dysplasia of the renal artery and carotid arteriopathy are seen on CT, further demonstrating the systemic arteriopathy often associated with SCAD. Coronary angiography shows spontaneous dissection of the right posterior descending artery, which was treated with a drug-eluting stent. This angiographic series shows spontaneous dissection of the first obtuse marginal artery, with further progression of the dissection affecting the circumflex artery and second obtuse marginal artery. Coronary angiography demonstrates dissection of the left anterior descending artery, extending into the first diagonal artery, highlighting the complexity of the SCAD lesions. Coronary angiography demonstrates multivessel SCAD involving the obtuse marginal artery and the posterior descending artery, as shown by the yellow arrows. These findings highlight the extent of arterial involvement in this patient with SCAD. Comprehensive CT angiography shows fibromuscular dysplasia affecting the bilateral carotid arteries, clearly visible with the characteristic string of beads appearance indicated by the arrows. This systemic vascular pathology is frequently associated with SCAD, this case highlights a rare and often fatal presentation of coronary vasospasm, manifesting as sudden cardiac arrest due to ventricular fibrillation in a 51-year-old man. The key objectives of this case are to recognize the fatal potential of coronary vasospasm, emphasize the importance of a multimodal diagnostic approach, and discuss interventional strategies like acetylcholine challenge testing for diagnosis. This visual summary illustrates the step-by-step -step diagnostic and management strategy for a case of malignant arrhythmia due to coronary vasospasm, emphasizing the integration of EKG, coronary angiography, intracoronary imaging, and acetylcholine provocation testing, followed by pharmacological management and ICD implantation. EKG on hospital admission shows sinus tachycardia without obvious ischemic ST segment changes, which initially did not reveal the severity of the underlying vasospasm. Coronary angiography reveals severe stenosis in the left main coronary artery and left anterior descending artery, initially suggesting atherosclerosis but later found to be related to vasospasm. Repeated angiography and intravascular ultrasound show normal left main artery and mild left anterior descending artery disease, confirming the transient nature of vasospasm and the absence of significant atherosclerotic disease. Cardiac MRI reveals subendocardial delayed enhancement involving the mid to apical septal wall consistent with prior ischemic damage, despite normal coronary arteries on angiography. Baseline EKG is normal without significant ST segment changes, and the coronary angiogram shows mild focal spasm in the mid and distal LAD. After acetylcholine injection, EKG reveals ST segment elevation, corresponding with extensive spasm in the left main and LAD on the angiogram. Following a higher dose of acetylcholine, EKG shows worsening ST segment elevation and the angiogram reveals a more pronounced string sign with left main and LAD spasm. After nitroglycerin administration, the EKG normalizes, and the angiogram shows complete resolution of the coronary spasm. This case highlights an increased thromboembolic risk in patients with cardiac amyloidosis, even in sinus rhythm, underscoring the importance of a new diagnostic approach for risk stratification. Patients with cardiac amyloidosis are at risk of thromboembolic events, even in sinus rhythm.
The case emphasizes the need for new diagnostic strategies, such as assessing atrial strain parameters to predict thrombotic events. The visual summary depicts a patient with undiagnosed light chain cardiac amyloidosis who developed a cardioembolic ischemic stroke while in sinus rhythm, highlighting reduced atrial strain parameters as a diagnostic marker. Physical examination reveals macroglossia, a key clinical feature strongly associated with light chain amyloidosis, indicating systemic involvement. EKG on admission shows sinus tachycardia with a pseudo-infarct pattern in precordial leads, along with low voltages in peripheral leads, findings suggestive of cardiac amyloidosis. Speckle tracking analysis reveals a reduction in global longitudinal strain and atrial strain, indicating impaired ventricular and atrial function commonly observed in amyloid heart disease. Brain CT and cerebral angiography show total occlusion of the middle cerebral artery and incomplete filling of the artery consistent with cardioembolic stroke. Histologic analysis of subcutaneous fat biopsy shows bright positivity for anti-ALK, confirming interstitial amyloid deposition, which is critical for the diagnosis of light chain amyloidosis. Chest CT imaging demonstrates an intracavitary thrombus in the right auricle, contributing to the thromboembolic risk in sinus rhythm in the context of cardiac amyloidosis. This case presents a rare instance of eosinophilic myocarditis occurring in a heart transplant recipient after a COVID-19 infection. The case emphasizes the challenges in managing eosinophilic myocarditis in post-transplant patients, particularly in the context of COVID-19. Eosinophilic myocarditis is an uncommon cause of heart failure that can occur post-COVID-19 infection, particularly in transplant patients. Early diagnosis and timely intervention are critical for improving outcomes in such high-risk cases. Endomyocardial biopsies reveal significant eosinophilic infiltration in heart tissue, consistent with eosinophilic myocarditis. These findings are critical for diagnosing and guiding treatment in this case. This figure demonstrates the correlation between declining left ventricular ejection fraction and rising eosinophil levels in the blood highlighting the acute deterioration and subsequent response to steroid treatment. Donor-specific antibodies are monitored throughout the patient's clinical course, showing fluctuations before and after heart failure readmissions, providing insights into the immunological response in transplant recipients. This timeline visually summarizes the patient's clinical course, showing the progression from COVID-19 diagnosis to eosinophilic myocarditis diagnosis, treatment, and eventual improvement. This case report describes the first successful simultaneous heart kidney transplant in a patient with Maylaw's cardiomyopathy, a rare condition caused by a mitochondrial gene mutation characterized by mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. The patient underwent the transplant due to severe cardiac and renal dysfunction, and the case serves as a potential model for future similar cases involving mitochondrial disease and multi-organ failure. Key takeaways emphasize the complexity of managing Maylaw's cardiomyopathy, especially with multiple organ involvement. The case highlights the potential for simultaneous heart-kidney transplantation in such patients and calls for further research and the development of guidelines for handling mitochondrial diseases in the context of organ transplantation. Pre-transplant images show a severely reduced left ventricular ejection fraction of 5 to 10 percent, while post-transplant echocardiograms demonstrate a significant recovery with an ejection fraction of 60 to 65 percent. This illustrates the functional recovery following successful transplantation. This case discusses recurrent Takotsubo syndrome triggered by both emotional stress and happiness, emphasizing the role of different emotional triggers in the syndrome's recurrence. Early imaging of the left ventricle is crucial for diagnosing Takotsubo syndrome. The importance of managing both broken and happy heart syndromes with medication is highlighted. Echocardiogram on second presentation shows apical hypokinesis with basal hyperkinesis, demonstrating the characteristic heart movement in Takotsubo syndrome. Coronary angiogram on third presentation reveals no significant obstruction, confirming Takotsubo syndrome. Ventriculogram demonstrates apical hypokinesis, a classic feature of Takotsubo syndrome. The revised Mayo Clinic criteria summarize the essential diagnostic features of Takotsubo syndrome, including transient myocardial dysfunction, absence of coronary disease, and characteristic EKG changes. This is a clinical case of a twin pregnancy in a patient with Fontan circulation and a homozygous MTHFR mutation. Twin pregnancy presents a high cardiovascular risk for patients with congenital heart disease, requiring close monitoring and risk assessment. 
The learning objectives emphasize the importance of proper cardiovascular risk stratification in Fontan patients before pregnancy and a multidisciplinary follow-up during pregnancy to reduce complications. This case presents a two-year-old boy with a small ventricular septal defect who developed multivalvular endocarditis caused by a bacterial infection from granulocatella adiacens. Despite the small defect, significant complications led to the need for replacement of multiple valves. The key objectives are to recognize that patients with even small ventricular septal defects are at risk for endocarditis and to understand the expanding list of bacteria involved in endocarditis, such as granulocatella, requiring genomic sequencing for identification. The echocardiogram shows a large vegetation measuring 24 by 10 millimeters on the mitral valve, highlighting the severity of the infection and the extent of the vegetations. This echocardiogram reveals additional vegetations on the mitral valve and right ventricle, further demonstrating how extensive the infection was and its effects on multiple valves. This image shows vegetations on the pulmonary valve and right ventricular outflow tract, with the infection affecting multiple valves in the heart and not just the left side. The transesophageal echocardiogram shows a large vegetation on the mitral valve, leading to significant mitral regurgitation, illustrating the impact on valve function. The long axis view on transesophageal echocardiogram shows multiple vegetations in the right ventricular outflow tract, located adjacent to the ventricular septal defect, emphasizing the high risk of endocarditis even with a small defect. This case focuses on polyvalvular dysplasia and vascular abnormalities in a neonate with a variant in the FLNA gene, highlighting genetic causes for structural heart disease and the associated vascular complications. The key takeaway from this case is the recommendation for whole exome sequencing in congenital polyvalvular disease and the importance of considering vascular integrity when FLNA variants are suspected. This newborn echocardiogram demonstrates biatrial enlargement and thickened atrioventricular valves. The restricted flow on Doppler imaging suggests tricuspid stenosis with evidence of double orifice mitral valve and arch hypoplasia. The 3D CT reconstruction of aorta shows severe aortic coarctation with hypoplasia, contributing to the patient's critical vascular complications. This image shows a piece of the left femoral artery intimal lining adherent to a catheter sheath, emphasizing vascular degeneration. Histology of the femoral artery shows disruption of the superficial media with disorganized elastic fibers and collagen deposition, further demonstrating vascular disorganization in this case. This figure highlights the likely damaging sequence variation in the FLNA gene, shown alongside other known variants, underscoring the rarity and significance of this genetic mutation. This case describes a 19-year-old man with two rare syndromes, which contributed to his sudden cardiac arrest during physical activity. A thorough evaluation after sudden cardiac arrest must include personal history, exercise testing, cardiac imaging, and genetic testing. Coronary artery anomalies are often involved in sports-related cardiac arrests in young patients. This table displays the laboratory data of the patient upon admission, showing significant electrolyte imbalances, including hyperkalemia and elevated creatinine levels. Initial EKG after admission reveals classic signs of hyperkalemia, with peak T waves and prolonged QRS intervals. Parasternal long axis view on echocardiography after transfer to tertiary care center shows the abnormal origin of the right coronary artery, indicated by the red arrow. Parasternal short axis view at the aortic valve level shows the prominent origin of the right coronary artery as marked by the red arrow. A 3D coronary CTA reconstruction and axial views demonstrate anomalous coronary origins, with the left coronary artery arising from the pulmonary artery and the right coronary artery from the aorta.